those that love the fruit thereof will eat of it. If you can control your tongue, that rudder on a ship, you can guide yourself out of Egypt. The Holy Spirit will guide you out of Egypt through the wilderness. And by the way, I don't know if you know, but Egypt to Canaan land is exactly an 11-day walk. But it took them 40 years. How long is it going to take you? So here's what happens in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Is this thought-provoking tonight? It's information night, but it's also inspiration night. See, in the outer courts, you get an outer courts preacher, it's just informational anointing. In the inner courts, it's inspirational. But in the Holy of Holies, it's impartation to live for and change to you. It's exciting, isn't it? See, in the outer courts, you're drinking milk. The milk of the Word. In the inner courts, it's kind of like hamburgers and french fries. But in the Holy of Holies, it's strong meat. Can you handle strong meat? Do you have the teeth to chew on it? Or we have to get some baby bottles and just line you up. Steak. Want some steak. Let us go on unto perfection, the Apostle Paul said. And this we will do if God permit. Hebrews 6.1 Not laying again the doctrine of repentance and faith toward God and water baptisms, and the laying on of hands, and the raising. This is the basics of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Bible Basics 101. Be not drunk with wine, wherein there is excess, or dissipation, or riotous living, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Yes. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. I'll tell you a quick illustration. We are getting to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. But here's what the difference is between religion and relationship. Religion is a set of rules of do's and don'ts that will literally castrate you Woo. and make you unfruitful. Woo. <laughs> relationship, on the other hand, will circumcise you and make you more fruitful. There it is. There it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When somebody tries to keep you from operating in what you've been op called to operate in, they try to cut you off, it will make you unfruitful. By the way, that's in the Bible. The Apostle Paul says, if circumcision profits you anything, obeying the law he was talking about, did you receive the Spirit by grace or by obeying the law? Now that you got it by grace, why do you go back to the law and be circumcised? Then he said these words. I'm sorry, he was a graphic preacher. I'm just following his lead. He said, I would that you would be completely cut off. Or NIV is emasculated. Or another translation would be castrated. So it is biblical what I'm talking about. The metaphors and the biblical basis don't get offended at me get offended at the word. Okay? I'm trying to give an illustration because we're going to come out from childish behavior, go on under perfection, but we've got to get through the wilderness. We've got to get through that area where we vacillate back and forth. What I do, I do not want to do. What I do not want to do, I do. When I do that, which I do not want to do, it's not me who does it. It's the sinful nature living within me. Oh, who will deliver me from this body of death, oh, wretched man that I am? But thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, the anointed one, who lives in you, and he lives in me. And he says, greater is he that's in you than he that's within the world, because you are more than a conqueror. Turn to your neighbor point and say you're more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. Religion tells you you can't do it, you're a failure. Relationship says, I believe in you. Hallelujah. But there's some things I've got to circumcise out of your heart. I've got to circumcise out. Egypt, so that you could go on into the land of Canaan. You know, before you got saved, you never had enough money. You might have had more money before you got saved than you do now. But you never had enough, because he who loves money never has money enough. 
But when you got saved, God probably put you on a little different pattern and plan. He began to call you in to walk by faith. He began to get you to begin to give Him 10%, which was a faith act. And fearfully, you began to say, but I got more month at the end than I do money. And God says, trust me with the 10%. I'll make your 90% become sanctified. And all of a sudden, your desires for certain things began to change. You realized that it wasn't about the worldly stuff. And your desires began to change. And you said, you know what? This is about the kingdom stuff. I think instead of buying that outfit, I think I'll buy a slave out of Sudan for $35 for the price of two goats over there because they're getting their arms cut off for their faith in Jesus, and I want to extricate them out of that situation through this ministry that's righteous, and I want to buy slaves instead of having another outfit in a 56th color. But before you're saved, the last thing you could think of was them. Why? Because they weren't your problem. That was another country, that was another nation, and it was the government's job to fix it. Ouch. Don't think it's the government's job to fix it and then complain about who we get in the administration when you have that attitude. Because if they're not born again and thinking kingdom minded, he who loves money never has money enough and they want more of yours. But if you get kingdom minded, your perspective changes. You no longer are over in the outer courts living in the flesh. You're looking on into the inner courts and the Holy of Holies beyond. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly or completely. W-H-O-L-L-Y, not H-O-L-Y. May He completely sanctify you or make you holy, but in every area of your life. And I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have a spirit, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Know you not that the Holy Spirit dwells in your temple today? Where does He dwell? He dwells in your spirit man. And guess what? Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. A lot of information tonight, but there's also inspiration, and there's also about to be impartation for change, for transformation. You're about to change pieces of real estate. Remember that old sitcom they had years ago, Moving On Up? To the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky. See, you uh, people 40 and older know what I'm talking about. You others are going to have to Google it. Right? There's one back there who's 29 who's done history lessons. Move, moving on up to the east side, to a deluxe apartment in the sky. It was talking about people that came out of living in the projects. And they moved into a deluxe apartment in the sky into a nicer neighborhood with nicer amenities. Wouldn't you like to come out of Romans 6, come out of Egypt, come out of bondage and slavery, and make it on into the Beverly Hills that God has for you? And I'm not talking about a physical location as much as I'm talking about a spiritual location and a perspective on life. Because when you begin to see things the way God sees them, all of a sudden, you have heaven's perspective on it from an aerial point of view looking down at the situation instead of a horizontal point of view looking straight at the situation wondering if you're going to be able to slay the giant. From heaven's perspective, the giant is much smaller. From the earthly perspective, he's much bigger. From an earthly perspective, your friends will tell you that giant's way too big to hit. From a heavenly perspective, you'll say, that giant's way too big to miss. Yeah. 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 Man. Yeah. Turn with me, if you will. Because we're going to look at the difference between obedient faith, experimental faith, and commanding faith, and we're going to close. 
Because in the outer courts, it's obedient faith. In the inner courts, it's experimental faith. And in the Holy of Holies, it's commanding faith. Turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Because this is where Peter started. And this is where you and I start. We all start equal at the foot of the cross. There's no shortcuts in the kingdom. If you think there's a shortcut, it might cost you longer to get there. The quickest way to get there is to repent. And be baptized. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. And begin to fast and pray as you read the word, as the Holy Spirit illuminates. Begin to praise Him. And now you come into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies where you're no longer asking, you're no longer seeking, but you knock and you're invited in to the King's table. And you are transformed into the same image and likeness of Him by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, We with all unveiled faces behold the glory of the Lord. We, we are changed into the same image and likeness as we behold Him. See, when you look at your problems, you don't become like Him. When you look at other people with gossip and bitterness and backbiting and slander and strife, what well, He said and she said, and, well, He didn't do this. Are you ministering the accuser of the brethren, spirit for the devil, or are you ministering the spirit of intercession with Jesus? The only time you're to look down on your brother or sister is when you're bending over to help pick them up. You might have to get some Christians off of them who are pointing fingers. Sometimes throw some elbows in love. Right? Get them up, dust them off. See, religion looks at the problem, relationship looks at the solution. Religion says they can't, and you put them in a set of rules and regulations. They keep them in bondage. They have to earn their way back in. The relationship says, prodigal son, kill the fatted calf for him. Prodigal son, give him a coat of authority and responsibility. Give, give him a ring of authority. Put shoes on him. He's no longer a slave. Give him the American Express black card. <laughs> Charge it, brother. You're a born-again shopper again. You're in my kingdom. <laughs> but religion says, Dad, you never did that for me. I've been good. Let me tell you all the things that I've done. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I don't go with the girls who do. You never did that for me. He's been out in the pigsty. How can you give him all that stuff? Because religious people do not understand grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, right? But now that grace is abounded to bring us back, shall we sin more that grace might abound? God forbid, come out from among them. We love Him because He first loved us. To much is forgiven, much is indeed loved. Who will love more, the one that's been forgiven more, or the one that's been forgiven less? The one who's been forgiven more. Religion keeps you down. Relationship draws you to a higher level. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and it came to pass, verse 1, that the people pressed upon Jesus, pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Genesaret, verse 2, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a drought, a big catch of fishes. Verse 5, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Master, rabbi, teacher, listen, you're pretty good in scripture memorization and expository teaching of the word. We respect you. We know that you've been to the school of the day. And, and, and we don't know the scriptures like you, but look, we're fishermen. This is our area of expertise. We've toiled all night. We've caught nothing. And we're tired. Nevertheless, because you said it, we're going to do that which is contrary to logic and reason in our area of expertise. Because we believe you're one sent from God. We believe you've got a word of wisdom. Nevertheless, 
at your word, I will let down the net. Actually, he partially obeyed because he said let down the nets and he only let down one. You ever done something like that? God told you to do something? He might have told you to give a certain amount you gave a part. Might have told you to go bless somebody with a certain word and you gave part of the word. Right? Tell the truth. I mean, we do it. Okay? Nevertheless, God still blessed, didn't he? And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we toil all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. See, this is our court's obedience because it's in the Bible we do it. If you're not doing what's in the Bible, you'll be stuck in the outer courts your whole life until you begin to obey. Begin to obey. Begin to trust and obey. When you begin to obey in the little things, he'll give you authority over more. How can he trust you with the land of milk and honey if you're not obedient in the little things? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I love industrial strength though. <laughs> has multi uses. We're still thinking of more. <laughs> Nevertheless, at your word. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. See, the minute you begin to do what God told you to do, go share the gospel with somebody. Skip lunch and pray. Start a Bible study. Hand out a track. If the Lord is telling you to do it, it's obedient faith. And when you obey Him, you'll be catapulted out of the fleshly outer courts of Egypt, and now you're on your own in the wilderness. Is it scary or is it exciting? It's exciting. It's exciting. When you begin to obey this book and begin to apply it, it's the most exciting book in the world. When you don't do what it says, it is the most boring book in the world. It's not the book that makes it boring or exciting, it's your reaction or your response to it. Do you know what responsibility is? It's your response to your God-given ability. We've been given differing abilities. And if you have something in a gift that I don't have, see, I am not responsible to play the piano. I'm responsible to push the demo button for it to play. Because I don't have ability in those areas. But as a sister came up tonight, she had an ability. Her response to my request, does anybody play the piano, now became her response ability. And now that she's been faithful in that, God will begin to give her authority over more. Because she left the outer courts of, well, what if they don't like it? What if I miss a note? What if, you see? But she said, no, I'm going to leave that because who do I seek to please, God or men? If I was still seeking to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1.10 and 11. So here's what happens. Obedient, outer court faith. Peter, a fisherman, contrary to logic, did what God told him to do. Did what Jesus instructed him to do. Verse 7, And they beckoned unto their partners, which were on the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. That's a pretty good load of fish, isn't it? Do you think fishermen ever get that much fish, where it loads both of them, to the point to where both boats are about to sink? You know, if you are to obey what God is speaking to you in the small things, you'll be amazed at the harvest that will come in for you. Stop looking at what's in your hand as if it's your harvest. If it was your harvest, it would be bigger than what's in your hand. Amen. If it's your seed on the other hand, don't eat it. Sow it. Because as long as it's in your hand, that's the least it will ever be. That's the most it will ever be. The minute it leaves your hand at the obedience and leading of God, it's the least it will ever be. Because when you sew up your two fish and five loaves into the hands of Jesus, it multiplies in the glory. And then you end up with baskets left over and everybody gets fed. That's right. 
Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You know, when you obey God and the thing works and it becomes supernatural, because you did what you could do in the natural, God added his super to it, it became supernatural, it will cause you to go, Oh, this is, this, this is a powerful God. Amen. It will cause you to repent. See, repent and be baptized in your obedient outer court's faith. For he was astonished at all that were with him and the draught of fishes which were they had taken. And so was James and John and the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. From this point forward, you will catch men. Fear not from henceforth. Thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed Jesus. I'd been born again for about 30 days. I had a dream. I was in a prison cell in Leavenworth Penitentiary. It was 1990. And I was reading an NIV Bible at the time. And I had a dream where Jesus came to me while I was reading the Bible. And I can remember it as if it was yesterday. And the Bible was there, and I was reading Luke chapter 5. And it was in the left side of the right hand page of my Bible in the dream. And by the way, I hadn't read Luke chapter 5 yet in my Bible. I'd only been born again a month and I was kind of doing Genesis, then Matthew, then Exodus, then Mark. Then I was going to do Leviticus. Leviticus was a tough book for a new believer. Right? Still kind of tough. And then I was going to head toward Luke. I hadn't been there yet. The point was, in my dream, Jesus came to me from behind. And he put his hand on my shoulder, like an elder brother, and he opened the Bible before me, and it fell to Luke chapter 5. He said, Fear not, from henceforth thou wilt catch men. Henceforth thou shalt catch men. I woke up, opened my Bible, and sure enough, at the exact place, in my NIV paperback Bible, that I tore the covers off of reading voraciously while in the hole in Leavenworth Penitentiary in that six-month time period where I read the Bible all the way through. That's why we give away leather-bound Bibles, because the difference between the average prisoner with a Bible with a lot of time on their hands, and they know they've sinned, they want to repent, and they want to change, versus a civilian on the outside in the average church in America. I said the average church, not this one. We're above average. Amen. Right? Amen. Because we're moving on into perfection, right? It's not seven points in a poem. I didn't hand you the little sheet so you could fill out the little blanks to show somebody you've been there for the sermon, right? Nothing wrong with that. It's a great place to start, but let us move on. Amen. Opened my Bible and there it was, Luke chapter five, and I realized at that point that the Lord was calling me into ministry. Are you going to shrink back under perdition, or are you going to believe under the saving of your soul? Long story short, there was some warfare over that vision. My co-defendant turned against me. He didn't like my interpretation of the vision. His interpretation of the vision was that we were to snitch and catch men for the government. Oh, no. And I said, I don't think that's what it means. He said, well, what do you think it means? I'm like, well, I've been saved a month, six weeks, something like that. I was a little hesitant to think that we were called into the ministry. Anyway, he did two years, seven months. I did 19 years, six months, and a week. I think you know his application of that verse versus mine. Anyway, a lot of people ended up getting saved while I was away. Be careful how you get revelation, interpretation, and application. Not saying he was wrong. I just know what God called me to do. He did, by the way, show up on my third indictment on the same evidence four years, 11 months, and 27 days after the conduct. And my Christian brother who helped lead me to Christ was the government's key witness against me to lead me to the cross a second time for crucifixion. But God delivered me out of the snare of the fowler and miraculously delivered me out of that case. In spite of my sin, because he doesn't just cover it, he washes it away by his grace and mercy. A footnote to that story, that co-defendant 
ended up funding the gospel on the outside, and I don't have any idea how many people have derivatively been saved because of his gift of giving. Amen? Amen. So God has a plan for everyone's life. I just knew that wasn't the one he had for me at the time. Sounds like it would have been easier, though. <laughs> can't we just get a scapegoat or two? Why go to the pen when you can send a friend? Okay. <laughs> okay, so here we've got obedient, our court's faith. <laughs> Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, if you will. Matthew chapter 14. Let's talk about experimental faith. Because once you've been obedient in the outer courts, you get promoted out of Egypt into the wilderness. And now you get an opportunity to begin to experiment with God. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, about three miles, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary, 5,280 feet. We're going to get into commanding faith. Stay in the name of Jesus. Ah, okay. That's in the Holy of Holies. We'll know if I was in the Holy of Holies when I did it, or if I was just experimenting, right? But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, about three miles in, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, what, walking on the sea. Three miles in. It wasn't just a temporary faith where I think I'll walk across this short stream to get to the other side. I think I'll take a three-mile walk on the water. That's faith. You better hear from heaven. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway, immediately, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Scriptures say, Be not afraid, do not fear, fear not, 365 times from my understanding. It's one for every day of the year. Wow. You've been not given a spirit of fear unto bondage, but you've been given a power and love and of a sound mind. So if the enemy tries to bring you into fear, say, I've, been not, I've not been given a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. You can have a reverential fear of God, but you don't fear anything. Because greater is He that's in you than he that's within the world. The question is, are you letting Him out? Or are you hiding Him in your spirit, in the Holy of Holies of your personal tabernacle? Are you letting Him out in your mind, will, and emotions? Are you letting Him out of your body to heal the sick and to cast out devils and to release the love of God and the fruit of the Spirit. See, because when you come out of Egypt and you get through the wilderness and you get into the Holy of Holies, that's when Jesus is truly revealed through your life. It's difficult to cook an egg on the sidewalk except on specific days. Because the heat comes from the top down. You know, there's some things happen when the heat comes from the top down in your Christian experience. But there's a whole different thing, a whole different dynamic that occurs when the fire is coming from the underside on the pan and cooking the egg, isn't it? Are you allowing the fire of God to bubble up through you? Are you bold for Him? Are you willing to be bold for His name? I'm not talking about being bold for your denomination or your religion or your your personal doctrine or dogma.